can always go backwards as you leave and new people come in. Or, you know, <laughs> Well, I'm Bonnie Auslander, and I direct the CoGod Center for Business Communication. So obviously, I'm over at CoGod, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in my shop later. But I did. I think I gave everyone who's here a little rack card that tells you a little bit about us. And I convinced my colleagues to join me on this. Sally Fowler. Now, maybe do you want to say maybe say your department too? Sure. I'm Sally Fowler, and I'm um, a professor, actually an executive in reference in um, residence, which is sort of another word for professor, I guess, <laughs> and the management department at CODAD. And I'm Casey Evans. I'm also an executive in residence in the accounting department. Uh, Michael Matos, full-time business librarian, uh, part-time adjunct professor in ITech, the information technology department at CODAD. Yes, many hats, many hats. So we thought we'd just start a little bit, you know, we presume you're here because you already are interested and perhaps don't need much persuasion, but I just thought it would be helpful just to kind of review why is it important? Why should we bother to have public speaking for our students? And you know, we can't help it. We're from the business school, so we go straight to the bottom line, and that's, of course, the employers. I, I, at one point, I had recruiters, and I thought, that doesn't sound very, that sounds a little too business school specific, so I changed it to employers. But it is um, highly sought after, and I actually have a little evidence that I'll share with you in a second. And students know, know they need it. Um, so we find that although they're often, I don't know, someone made the analogy of the, the broccoli or the spinach, you know, they, they, they know they need it, they, they, want, they want it, um, even though they sometimes uh, are anxious about it and resist it in various ways. But we, all of us, have found students incredibly receptive to including it. And here's a little bit of that evidence that I mentioned. Um, this is from NACE, from the National Associations of College and Employees. This is very recent, 2013, and um, the, the verbal piece is very high. I also teach writing, so I'm always interested to see where writing is against um, spoken communications. But in the most recent surveys, I don't know how significant the tilt is, but it's, it's tended to heavily more towards oral. Um, and I always think it's um, also about listening, you know, which this implies but doesn't actually state in the first one. And then I just have one more that I thought is interesting too, the gap, like who's responsible for getting these students up to speed? Um, and so this is, this is employers again, and you can see that hardest to find but most important to you, and then look at the gap, you know, is a pretty significant gap down to positive attitude, <laughs> which we'll work on as well. So just a little bit of evidence um, about why it's important to, to do it and, and why it's needed. And then I'll just share two other reasons why you should certainly um, include it in your classroom. And this applies to writing too, right? We know from a lot of research that if students are, have to write about their subject matter in their fields, they report, by the way, higher satisfaction with the class. It's, it's a, a very easy way to get your scores to go up, which seems completely counterintuitive, <laughs> um, your sets to go up. But um, and it does apply to, to public speaking as well, because they're obviously, in, they're forced to, to uh, ingest the material and then uh, return it to an audience, and it, it, it puts pressure on them to think about it more clearly. Um, and so there's increased engagement in course mastery. And as I will mention a little bit more at the end, uh, listening, I think, uh, if you are thoughtful about how you engage the other students as an audience, mm -hmm. then you're going to see a, a, a rise in listening skills and even coaching, which I'll allude to again a little bit later. So that's just a little bit about the why. I now wanted to just, the bulk of our conversation with you will be three sort of three little case studies, and then we'll just come back. I'll come back at the end and bookend with a few other thoughts on resources and some sort of how-tos. Um, so we share with you three models, and I think, yeah, we're actually in order. Not so clever. Well, we're sort of <laughs> it was an accident. But <laughs> well, except it's right to left to right. But going <laughs> in the wrong direction. So Sally will talk about. It's in three. order if you're. <laughs> Hebrew. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, so, so here we would just say it's it, the it, from left to right would be um, take more time to implement and be a greater percentage of the course from the student's point of view in terms of how much it's weighted. Um, and, and also in level of formality. So Sally will start with something that's relatively informal and Casey will mention a sort of middle and then Michael has the most full-blown piece because this is a semester long project that has writing as well as public speaking. So let me turn it over now to Sally who will discuss a little bit about this course and um, how it works. Okay. Um, so I teach a course called Global Corporate Citizenship, which is part of the core curriculum for business students. Um, and it's also now part of Gen Ed. Um, it, 
most of the students are sophomores, but we always end up with some freshmen and a few juniors and seniors who just didn't get around to taking it. Um, but there's a number of different reasons um, why I use these news talks in the course. The course basically is about the relationship between business and society. Um, so there's stuff in the news every single day that's very related to the course. Um, and so by doing the, having the students talk about various things, topics that they see in the news, it relates the course really well to what's happening today. So it keeps it current. Um, and it also provides opportunities um, for the students to make presentations. We have a number of core courses in COGA that have been designated to work on certain skills. And this course happens to be an oral presentations course. Um, so it's meant to give them opportunities to practice oral presentations. Um, and then, of course, it's really good to get the students to think about the course material in relation to things that are actually happening in the world. Um, so, um, I can't, of course, oh, yeah. see what, okay. oh, you put, is that the second slide? That's the, it's the first, <laughs> Sorry. That's the objectives. So okay, yeah. um, so those are the objectives. Um, the way we do it in terms of mechanics is that at the beginning of class every day, usually three, occasionally four students um, make a short presentation about a topic in the news in the last week that relates to the day's subjects. Um, and that's not hard to do. For example, we spend several days on uh, environmental sustainability. So if it were right now, one of the students would undoubtedly talk about the Keystone um, pipeline and the debate about that. Um, so they, so it's very informal. Um, the students don't dress up, they don't use slides or anything like that, it's just they just stand in front of the class um, and they talk about the subject. Um, and then they try and get this, they try and start a discussion among the students. Um, and after the first few times, they get pretty good at this um, because they learn that they need to pick topics that are of interest to the students and that the students can sort of get their arms around. But they pick up on that pretty fast and so you can spend a fair amount of time uh, and obviously I can control that, but it's fine with me if we spend a little more time at the beginning of the class with the students really engaged in discussion. Um, so then, so basically it's structured, the course is structured so that each student presents twice during the semester. Um, and that gives them an opportunity to think about what they did the first time and to try and do better. Um, and um, we also record the presentations using Panopto. Um, and then we can easily upload them into Blackboard. Okay, so basically everyone in the class has access to all the recordings of the people in that class, um, but no other, I mean, it's not publicly available at all. Um, but what we do is, so everybody presents once, and then it's sort of the midpoint of the class, and um, so usually someone from Bonnie's group comes in and talks about the presentations in general. You know, what makes them stronger or weaker, um, how could they be improved, that sort of thing. And then they all have a chance to present again, um, which, you know, I usually see a pretty significant improvement between the two. We also have the students in the class give written feedback, um, a very simple form, which I think Bonnie has on a slide if you want to see it later, um, where they can give feedback and then at the end of the class they're collected and the students take them away. I don't even look at those forms usually. Occasionally I look at them if the student forgets to bring them just so I can make sure they're being constructive, but they have almost always been very constructive. If anything, they're too supportive of, their others, mm -hmm. of the other students, but that's, that's really a good thing. Um, and so then, finally, at the end of the class, um, the students write a written critique of themselves. Each student writes a critique of him or herself in terms of pres the presentations. So they talk about the presentations that they did, they compare the first presentation to the second presentation, um, and then I think the most important thing, and they base that basically on watching themselves in Panopto, which, of course, I'm sure you all know there's nothing more horrible than watching a recording of yourself <laughs> under any circumstances. I think that must even be true of, like, George Clooney, you know? I mean, it's just horrible. Um, but they, so they do that, and then they have the um, feedback, written feedback from the students, and they write a critique of themselves, and then they come up with a plan of five things um, that they want to work on during the year ahead. Um, 
And so my objective in this assignment is to try and get them to pull all this together. And most of them do a very thoughtful job on that critique. Um, so I can tell that they've spent a lot of time thinking about it. And obviously, I hope that they actually put it to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And the critique. Oh, I didn't. I didn't advance. Here's the slide on the critique. I'm, I was too interested. <laughs> okay. I think I covered it. All. <laughs> okay. Good. All right. Great. So now let's. Uh, we're going to hear from Casey about a. And this is something we tried new this semester. Mm -hmm. So Casey will tell you how she's already used public speaking in her class, but a change she made. Yes. Yeah, so I am again in the accounting department of the course that one of the courses I teach is a forensic accounting course, which is an elective for our accounting students. And presentations really aren't a big thing in accounting classes. And so this is a little different for my students. And the reason I, I think it's important is um, I most recently was in consulting and worked with a lot of first year consultants and communications is just not not their strong suit in writing and public speaking. So I definitely make this a big part of the class. It's about the second half of the semester. And what they, I mean, it, it's a pretty standard assignment where they basically pick a fraud and write about it and apply the concepts from the class that we've discussed. Um, but it's, and then um, they do it in a memo format and then they have to present it to the class. And so, you know, similar to I'm sure many um, projects that you, you all might have done as well. Um, it's important to me that it's an individual project, so I wanted to keep it that way, but what I was running into is as the course, the, the number of students in the class got larger, um, my approach for presentations really wasn't going as well as I had hoped because what I had been doing is all those individual presentations were being, were being presented in class. And so the second half of the semester, it's a block class, I would take like the last hour, do like five or six in a chunk. And while, yes, each student was talking about a different fraud, they're all applying the same concepts from the class. It's boring. And um, it was taking up a lot of time. And it, I had a hard stop at 8 o'clock. And so we kind of just had to keep it moving. We didn't have a lot of time for a good Q&A. And it just it wasn't going. It was, I just didn't feel like it was going well. And I was bored. Um, I was like, great, it's a presentation time again. Mm -hmm. um, come 7 o'clock each class. So mm -hmm. what I decided to do to try this past semester, and I do think it went really well, take the presentations out of class. So it gives me all the class time back that I, I feel like I had lost um, because it kind of got unruly there. Um, but I think it's made it for a much more substantive um, exercise for the students as well. So what I did um, is pick, uh, and again, working with Bonnie's, um, Bonnie's group, eight time slots that the students, that I'm available, we have someone from Bonnie's office um, available as well and that the students can sign up for and about five or six students um, in each chunk, and they do the presentations in a smaller group. But I'm there, and then someone from the communica Business Communication Center is there as well. Um, they present to each other just like they would in the classroom, but uh, what's a little bit different, it seemed like a safer environment for them. They seemed a little, still some of them got pretty nervous, but they took it seriously. They all suited up for it. Uh, they, they embodied the role that kind of this um, project requires them to have. Uh, but I think what they appreciated most was the real substantive feedback that we had the time and kind of time to give to them. And so the way it would kind of technically work is each of all five students would present us about a 10 minute presentation. We'd hear all of them and the students that were in the audience had to engage in Q&A, that's part of the requirement. And then afterwards we had someone from Bonnie's, Bonnie's office critique, uh, provide them with constructive feedback on just their presentation style, their pace, their tone, their posture, but things that I didn't have time to do during class and you know I'm not the best person to really provide them that feedback anyway if we have uh, someone from, from the CBC and so and then I would separately follow up in an email with um, my comments on and their grade on the substance of their presentation. It was a lot more work probably for me, but I think the whole exercise became actually like a pretty substantive one. I do think like five years or you know, two years from now when they're at their first presentation for their boss, they can draw, they'll remember some of the things that they've learned here in this, in, in this exercise. And so if we go to the next slide, I, I don't know, that's what I think. I haven't gotten my steps back yet. I don't know exactly, you know, officially what the response is, but all the informal feedback I'd received is really positive just taking the presentations outside of the classroom in a smaller environment and providing, giving them the time um, for some real substantive uh, feedback was was positive, so. Mm -hmm. Great, okay. And, and lastly, we'll hear from Michael. This is, of course, a much longer project. 
So I teach a section of iTech 200, which is part of the core curriculum in Kogod. It's uh, called the Edge of Information Technology. And, and the course, as it was originally conceived, half of it is lecture time where we're talking about the role IT plays in organizations. The other half is hands-on uh, lab time where the students are getting experience using uh, productivity tools, spreadsheets, databases. It's primary reason for the lab portion is that eventually they'll be going on to classes taught by my, my colleagues who left here, quantitative courses, and they need to be comfortable with things like Excel be in an accounting class and, and be successful, or a finance class. The, uh, the department, and, and one thing that's also different here is that my colleagues, they, they crafted their assignments on their own and their, and their creativity. Mine is uh, across all sections of the course. So uh, since it's a core class, um, the department came together and they decided on this, this project called the ITR assignment, the Information Technology Review. And the goal was really to get students more engaged in the concepts of the lectures and to think creatively about uh, problem solving and adding business value using IT. Can we go to the next slide? Mm -hmm. And so the way the, the assignment is constructed is really a, a writing assignment with a presentation tacked on to the end. Uh, the students will first submit an individual paper, roughly about a page, where they'll identify a piece of emerging uh, IT and then talk about how it works and propose a business or an industry that could adopt this technology uh, for a business value. And then they're formed into teams. Uh, they settle on one topic to move forward on. And then it's a series of written deliverables of either uh, uh, what, what, uh, what topic have you chosen, explain to me how the IT works, and in each stage I'm providing written feedback back to the students saying you need to flush it out a little bit more on how it works. I'm not sure this business or this industry really can, you know, you need to kind of work on how, how that value is going to be expressed. And then uh, towards the end of the semester, we move into the, the presentation stage, and that's where they draft a, a, what will be a 10-minute presentation, and then Bonnie Center does practice presentations with them a week before they present in class for their final grade. Uh, so they present in front of the entire class, each team. Um, usually there's about uh, seven or eight teams, so it can be stretched over two class periods or an entire block. Um, but it doesn't necessarily fall into the same situation that Casey has because these are radically different information technologies, different businesses, so the presentations have very different uh, look, feel, and, and, and goals in them. So they are kind of fresh, even towards the end. And then um, kind of another thing that the department wanted to do is not to end there with, with everyone presenting. Uh, as the professor each, uh, of each section, they select their best in class team. And then during the uh, study day, uh, after classes are over, uh, they, uh, that best in class team will meet with the other sections and they pr uh, present in front of external judges. So we bring uh, alumni, people from elsewhere on campus like the o OIT office, or um, middle to senior managers in organizations that the, the college has a good relationship with. And it's an opportunity for those students to, to network, um, to present their ideas and hear them in front of their colleagues. Maybe we can move to the next. Yeah. Um, oh. oh, yes. <laughs> so so a, a chance to really kind of engage with the topic. And, and some of the benefits that I've noticed is that with a class like this that's a core class, you, you have low investment students. They're there because they have to be. They, they feel like a month of the course was optional as far as attendance. They don't necessarily submit their homework. But across the board, I've never had a situation where students didn't show up, present, present well, and engage in the Q&A, uh, even if I would look at them and say that's a low investment student. So we have that, we turn them into high investment through these, these presentations. And if we click again. Again, <laughs> okay. Um, oh. The other thing is, is that it, it provides, uh, when you think creatively about the topic, an opportunity for students to, to kind of, uh, you know, to pull upon their own interests. The marketing student will grab about the segment, talk about that. The accounting student will do all the financial information about the implementation. The management student will talk about how we're going to get people to use it. So it gives them an opportunity to pull in their own interests into an area that, for many of them, they're not interested in uh, that much. Let's click one more time. Yeah. And uh, finally, I think the, the most valuable thing about presentations, at least for this project, 
is it's out in the open. So all the students get to hear everyone's ideas, how they did their problem solving, how they handle Q&A, and then what, even, even on the most basic level of what, what do their slides look like. Mm -hmm. um, you know, oftentimes we submit papers and there's a lot of great ideas that only the professor gets to read, but here all the students get to, get to share in the experience. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And there are prizes, and maybe more important even, you can tell the sophomores are more interested in the prize money, but by the time they're a junior, they're like, oh, and they can put it on their resume, it's a line <laughs> on their resume. So that's a, another great feature. So just to conclude, uh, well, to begin to conclude, I guess, I um, thought I would just mention just a couple of things about process, a couple of things about assessment, and then just see what your questions are. We have a few sort of extra slides if they're relevant to your disciplines and your interests. Um, I just wanted to say, um, as I said, I teach writing as well as public speaking, and, and you know, the number one and most obvious difference is the issue of anxiety. So I think it's a good idea to take time to discuss anxiety, frankly, with your students to address how to, over, how to harness it. And uh, in a minute, I'll just share with you a slide that pretty much summarizes all, pretty much everything I have to say about it. But I think it's, it's worth it. I also posted on Blackboard a New York Times article, which is the best, really the best one page thing I've ever read, summarizing pretty much everything you need to know about public speaking. <laughs> Um, and we have the permanent URL, thanks to Michael, with his librarian hat on it, or whatever, the persistent, whatever it's called. So anyway, it's um, it, on, on our Blackboard site, it's, it's there, and, 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 and I really, I always hand it out, I think it's great. Uh, of course, videotaping has a lot of advantages, especially if you have Panopto in your classroom, it's really easy. Uh, but it's pretty easy to just order from AV, too. Well, that's true. It's just the uploading becomes a little more tedious, but... Um, but there's obviously lots of reasons to, to videotape, especially if students can see progress. I think just a one-shot uh, taping is generally discouraging because most of us don't like how we look on camera and go down this whole other spiral that's not very helpful, actually. And then, as I alluded to in the beginning, the importance of making sure you're, you're using um, students, you're capturing them as listeners. It's, it's so important, and, and what, what they perceive and how, how they can coach each other. And then a little bit more on assessment and on <coughs> So I think I'll just, just flip through a few of these last slides and then just turn it over to you for questions. Uh, it's very, very brief here. Um, this is maybe the single most important thing I talk about when I talk about anxiety, uh, th that it's not about performance. And we live in a, such a performance-driven culture and such a visual culture, and we're so saturated with <coughs> high-quality media and media people that we have these kind of false standards that aren't, that aren't helpful. But when the emphasis is on communication, and I always say, you know, in business, the most important thing is to have something worth saying. It's not necessarily how you say it. Of course, it's nice to say it clearly and without um and authoritatively, but if there's only one thing you could do, it's to say, have content, have something worth saying. I don't think that's true only in business. I think it's true in life, too. Um, and of course, this is to some extent not true, and, and those of us who were at the, Marlene was at the talk this morning about, you know, from the performing arts people about performance in the classroom, Obviously, there's a performance aspect to public speaking. Of course, you can't deny it. But I think to put the emphasis on communication, it calms everyone down. And it really, I've seen people just kind of relax after I've mentioned that. And then this next slide, I don't mean necessarily need to go through it with you, but um, <clears throat> these are probably like my top six points I make about public speaking, uh, about speech anxiety. We do talk about the biological reasons why when someone is staring at you that you feel anxious that it is rooted in biology and it is not, um, it's not something you necessarily ever get rid of and you probably shouldn't even have that as your goal, but how you can use anxiety. Um, and so I think that's, uh, I could say more about this, but I'll just go on. This is the uh, feedback sheet that Sally referred to. Um, very, very simple. Um, and I, I like it because it forces students when they're evaluating each other what's working. And I always say, if your classmate was going to give the speech again or the presentation again, what should they continue to do? Tell them what they're doing right. I'm a great believer in the importance of being specific with your praise. And then what could be improved and then any notes you wanted to make for yourself. And then at the bottom, I just remind them like some key things. So very, very simple. It's just a half sheet. Um, and I actually use a version of this when I evaluate for assessment. I just, it's this, to me, it's the simplest way to organize uh, material, what's working, what could be improved. So yes. On this, um, so obviously, I guess. So this is; these are given out to the audience. Yes. And so I'm, let's say, I'm in the audience and you're speaking, and I'd be taking notes on this. I'm not listening so much to the content. Maybe. Do you, right. How do you handle that piece? Because I'm 
yeah. some of our stuff is like I'm trying to get them to teach the students something. Yeah. And you know, yeah. content wise. So and also, I think it's very impossible when you're the audience member to evaluate. Like in, in Casey's case, you know, four presentations, and you're supposed to constantly be evaluating. So I would always say. You know, if there's four presentations, then one quarter of the class can be in charge of this Got it. and then rotate it. Got and it. I use color, I like color code it, and I scatter them around the room so they have the pink people are doing the first speaker, the green people are doing the second, and, and then at the end you just collate them. Yeah, I think that works well. I hear what you're saying about teaching concepts, and that may be something we can talk about as well. Cause because teaching is a little different, right? Public speaking and teaching are related, but right. they aren't. You get across that they've got actually looking at these stuff. Yeah, exactly. Um, this is just, I already gave you this, just a reminder. And this is a bit more um, from Sally about the specifics if you're interested in how she specifically tells the students. So I think we'll just leave it there for now and hear what, what your questions are and you, maybe you want to tell each other your discipline since we're such a small group. Um, I, I, can, I can say three of the four. Small but powerful. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> I teach in Red River, work with the LLMs and the law school, and um, we do a lot of public speaking, but a lot of writing too. I was interested, wh where does writing fit in with the employer expectations? So it depends on which survey you look at and which year, but it's, it's up there. Some years it seems to drop a little bit in the top, but it's up in the top four or five always. I think the issue too is sometimes they define it as how often do you find it is for people to be able to write reports? Mm -hmm. And then when you say reports, suddenly it's different than, you know, it's too narrow then. But it's, it's very high. And I can, mm -hmm. I tend to collect that stuff so I can share any of it with yeah. you. It's useful to have it because it, of course, solidifies the importance of what we do right. um, in the eyes of faculty and students. So, but what discipline are you? So I'm visiting from uh, GW. I'm just actually just started a couple weeks ago at their teaching and learning center there. So oh, I work with faculty. So I was coming here to kind of learn about some examples and ideas about public speaking. Um, I've sat in and done consultation with faculty on student presentations before. Huh? And one of the things that comes to mind is that there's been times when students are doing presentations that are fine. They're, they're giving the content, they're sharing, you know, their slides are fine, but the presentation itself is pretty boring, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious if you have that experience. And you know, it, it's easy to give feedback when somebody's slides are horrible and disorganized, and they're really quiet or mm -hmm. something. Um, mm -hmm. But if someone's presentation is kind of fine. So competent, but boring. Yeah. Yeah. What do you, what do you all think about that? <laughs> I guess since mine's the most salesman -y, yeah. uh, you know, we kind of try to encourage them to use certain techniques, like how to in, you know, ingratiate yourself to the audience at the beginning as an opening, or uh, maybe flipping things around. I mean, you do get things where they, you know, will you, oftentimes, I would say the presentations that I've encountered are boring, is they spend way too long talking about how the information technology works. Mm -hmm. That just kills an audience. Mm -hmm. Um, so I often give them, first the caveat, in two minutes I want to know who I am, how it works, and what the problem is and how you're going to solve it. And then I want you to spend the other eight minutes of the presentation explaining to me the pros and cons of it and how we're going to, how we're going to implement it. So kind of condensing what they often fixate on into a much smaller portion of the, of the time is how I dealt with it in the, the assignment so that I work with. So do you give with. that feedback? Um, kind of when you're introducing the assignment of the presentation initially, or is it after they've given it? So one one of the milestones in there is actually the the first time I taught the class, I didn't give that feedback, and I, I sat through probably half of them where they, they just, mm -hmm. I, I was like, well, there's there's no way you can be best in class because you, you would get killed in the, by, by, the other, by the other sections. So uh, what I do is I do meet with the students. Um, there's a meet with the professor week. And it's at that transition point where they're about to submit a substantive draft and before they've started the presentations. And then I kind of outline some, some just kind of ideas about this is how your presentation should be structured. Mm -hmm. And they, they usually take it to heart. And, and we don't have that problem. It's, it's usually more specifics that are the issue at that point. Mm -hmm. And but you have rehearsals too, right? Yeah, we have rehearsals with the CBC. So, so they probably also kind of uh, address those issues a week before the final yeah. presentation. Yeah, I, I guess I would add so to to what you said. I think I I would 
first I would ask about the assignment, mm -hmm. because a lot of assignments just breed dull presentations, right? They just <laughs> seem to demand them. So yeah. if there's a way to help, and this of course is a great exercise in diplomacy, which is 95% of what I do, is how to help the professor tweak the assignment without insulting them. Mm -hmm. And we could talk about strategies afterwards yeah. about that. <laughs> um, so that's really a part of it. Um, but the other thing I would say, and I'll just pull up um, Sally's instructions here, um, it's very important to, to teach students to begin with a grammar. And you know, I mean, in, in, if something is written down and we don't feel like reading it, we just put it to one side. But obviously, we're all in the same room with time going by when it's a presentation. So it's a very different form. And, Students, I think, need to be reminded of that. Mm -hmm. So I spend a fair amount of time talking about the beginning. Mm -hmm. I, I do think if you can grab an audience interest in the beginning, uh, they're, they're much more forgiving when in the middle you get to some technical part. And it's also good to be interesting there and interesting at the end, too. But at the beginning is critical. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's just also just, you know, it doesn't meet the audience's needs. If they're bored, you're not meeting their needs by definition, almost always. I mean, I guess there's, you know, cases of briefings on Capitol Hill which aren't intrinsically interesting and which do meet the audience's needs. But I don't think that that situation arises very often anywhere else outside of policy. <laughs> so, so I have more to say about that, but I think that might be enough. <laughs> but I think it's really interesting because when we were meeting to talk about this presentation, we were saying how lucky we are at COGOD to have the Center for Business Communications mm -hmm. and how there's a real need for that kind of thing for the university at large. And that maybe CTRL would be a good place for that. So maybe you're the answer to our prayer, <laughs> <laughs> or to everybody else's prayer. Bonnie's well, the answer. Oh, but she's at GW. She's at Health Plus. But um, I, I just started there, so I don't know if there's the, the equivalent. We can um, use it and say, "Well, GW." <laughs> That's so true. That made so I thought you said you were visiting from GW. Yeah, oh, but, but you mean just for, I the work at GW. Yeah. Here just for the day? Yeah. Okay, I didn't understand that. I thought you meant you were a visiting person yeah. for years. So. Right. Right. Did you say with videotaping? Mm -hmm. Don't don't just videotape them once. I mean, you're saying do it a couple of times so they see some sort of. Yeah, I think the research is uh, that I have understood it to be is that if you just do a one-time videotaping and and then you throw it at the student. They sometimes, first of all, they don't realize when they're successful. They, they, they tend to see only the negative. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, if you don't see progress, that adds to the feeling of So it's a good idea to debrief the presentation with somebody who's trained, you know, mm -hmm. trained. we're all trained at this point, you know what I mean? Just someone who's thoughtful about what's working and what could be improved and, and points out, you know, you sounded much better in the classroom. This looks a little bit muted, which is almost always the case. Um, and then, but ideally, over the course of the semester would be ideal. So they do you, you find those peer reviews helpful, even though they're they're always positive. I mean, I'm, I I use peer review, but I'm very leery of it. They they love everything. They oh, aren't yeah. always positive, actually. Yeah. I mean, they're pretty good about yeah. pointing out things that aren't working. Um, and sometimes, I mean, they're not they're not negative in the sense of being rude, but mm -hmm. they're negative in the sense of saying you should have picked a better topic mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know this was too complicated for us to understand mm -hmm. or you say um mm -hmm. a hundred times that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Yeah. Go, go ahead. One thing that um, I tell my students is this is a gift for your colleagues mm -hmm. and so that encourages them to be constructively helpful. On the yeah show. that's this, a good point. This is a gift. This is a, that's a gift. Yeah. You know it's a safe space and you know tell them what they need to know so when they get out in the middle of the world yeah you know they've heard it before. Yeah. Yeah. That usually encourages them to be not mean, but to, mm -hmm. to the gift thing. Really. And it really is. It's such a funny thing because I like, uh, I, mean, I hate the, the, the kind of knee jerk pleasantry of the low expectations. Good job. Yeah, I hate mm -hmm. that. And yet I'm also like, I think it's very important that people feel space, uh, safe, especially people who are, have anxiety about it. Mm -hmm. So you really, but that kind of coaching, training our students to be that kind of coach is like, that's even more important than anything on that list of things. <laughs> Please go ahead and. Yeah. I was gonna say one thing that might um, be something to think about uh, that I do with my college writing students is to respond as readers mm -hmm. and not as critics. Mm -hmm. So they're actually kind of giving the origin the person back uh, kind of temperature reading. Yeah. Here's where I was really interested. Yeah. Here's where I was confused. Yeah. Here's where you mm -hmm. lost me. So it's critical because that's a that's a note to the to the reader or the speaker to make adjustments, but it doesn't come across as you need to change this or, or and, and so they feel more comfortable, I think, because it's not calling for them to correct something or mm -hmm. call somebody on the carpet. It's just saying, 
this really grabbed me, this didn't. Yeah. I wasn't clear what you meant here. Yeah. I statement. Yeah, like reader that. response. We do that with response. reading with reading and writing yeah. on each other's text, and I would imagine the same thing could apply to presentation. Yeah, because they go into teacher mode, right? And they think, oh, I'm supposed to say that this is a B plus plus because I don't want to like be bad to my classmates. I think that's a really uh, <coughs> just a quick quick suggestion. Uh, there are two things that are important. Number one, I don't think that everybody is, at the end of the day, is going to be a good public speaker. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of them. They're just going to get a little better, we hope, right? Or nothing. <laughs> or nothing. That's nothing. number one. Yeah. So I don't think we should kid ourselves. I mean, you, you can lecture them, tell them, and what have you. But mm -hmm. um, the second thing, which I think this is very crucial, what, uh, what Casey said, how to create a safe environment. Safe environment takes lots of work at least a couple of weeks so a student can feel ah, comfortable in the mm -hmm. classroom mm -hmm. situation. Number three, I think it is very important is to, to do these kind of activities on a daily basis. Every time we meet, mm -hmm. we have the first 10 minutes discuss current issues. So mm -hmm. it is mm -hmm. the only problem that I have is with the providing I, again, I'm sorry, I agree with you 100%. I don't believe in peer uh, assessment. Yeah, well, I, I believe in them, but I uh, want No, I don't be believe. <laughs> I don't believe in the results. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but what is interesting is that when you talk about assessment, I find it very hard to make, uh, uh, to provide feedback in classroom. Mm. So what I do, I all, always say good, interesting, but if you need, one-on-one -on -one assessment, you come and see me in my office and I will give you. <laughs> I will story. give it to you. <laughs> I love that you too. Like I would email my feedback instead I, of providing I don't. I, I tell them, listen, you said don't if you it. are really interested and if you have the stomach, <laughs> come to my office and I'll tell you. But really and truly, again, uh, not to, uh, to uh, support my colleague, but uh, Bonnie is doing a wonderful job with her her and her group, and, and I invite her every, almost every semester mm -hmm. to come and tell my students how to make the final presentation. But uh, but again, I repeat, some people, it is public speaking, it's not sound, every it is face expression, it is manners. Some people are, they don't have it, mm -hmm. they're not dirty. See, Clearly. I disagree. But then I mean, every it. student can get better, and every single business student is going to have to be able to be competent at communicating orally to other people. Um, so I don't think we can just wash our hands. <laughs> no, no, it's Sorry, not you're out. question to washing your, your, your hands. I tell students from the beginning, from the first session, if you have problems speaking, you have two options. Tell me about it in advance, so I would never ask you a question in classroom. Or you can come to my office, and I may be able to help you. But mm -hmm. it's, the choice is, is yours. Mm -hmm. No pressure. Mm -hmm. And some people, they keep silent the whole semester. Mm -hmm. You open the door to that by, <laughs> by No, I, 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 yeah. mean, I am not, I'm not trained in psychology yeah. to understand why yeah. he or she is not speaking. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to put them in pressure. Yeah under pressure to, to speak that they, they would not learn yeah. if they don't feel comfortable. Yeah. I'd just say to that point, I do wrestle with this idea that I have introverts who are very smart but are not going to feel comfortable speaking. So I like, in, a, in an early conference, I like to ask people what their style, what they're comfortable. If they say they're more introverted, are they comfortable if I call on them? Sometimes they just need the invitation mm -hmm. to speak. Right. Mm -hmm. um, if they say, oh no, please don't ever call on me. Or call on me after midterm time, when I'm more comfortable. So you do, you can find a lot of conversation. But Sally, I 100% agree with you, not just for business students, in this life, yeah. you're gonna be in a PTA meeting, you're gonna be talking yeah. with your child's uh, teacher, yeah. you're going to be complaining about a product, you're gonna be on the phone with customer service. You need to be able to express yourself. Yeah. So I do uh, like this idea of how can I, be specific, how can I think about the audience, how can I convey what I need to convey as a life skill, yeah. no matter what, but meeting them where they are I think is very important and making sure that you respect who everybody is. Absolutely. One thing that I do to sort of, in terms of creating a safe environment is, um, 
I always ask for volunteers for the first couple of days. Um, and then, and people do volunteer. A lot of people volunteer, mm -hmm. and those are the people that are comfortable doing it. You know, and that way, mm -hmm. the other people I then I assign people to the other days, and by the time they have to do it, they've seen people mm -hmm. do it several times, so it doesn't seem so scary anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people would just die if you made them do it the first day. Mm -hmm. Other people the love it. About the kind of opposite end of the spectrum, though, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that is the completely not self-aware talker. <laughs> who goes on and on mm -hmm. and on and doesn't stop and doesn't listen and never responds to everybody else and thinks that they're a great public speaker. Yeah, yeah. We don't yeah have those are the people. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Um, those are the people that the, that the um, peer evaluations do not hesitate to point that out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I mean, I, I appoint one timekeeper. Yeah, and you know, you just raise your hand, it means you've got one minute. Yeah. And, uh, and that's a hard and, you know, big. Umbrella. But, but even in a classroom discussion, yeah, so I noticed we're talking. It's not a presentation. Yeah. Right, it's we're just discussion. discussion yeah. Yeah. And you were saying every day have something like this. Yeah. Those people. That's hard. Yeah. I mean, I generally pull those people aside pretty early. And if I think their ego needs flattering, I say, I need, you know, I'm so glad you're engaged. I need to hear more from other people. I might do a cough signal. Or if I think they just need putting down, I maybe would try something a little harsher. But you'd separate and do that well, I, like you, you were talking about. Yeah, I would pull them out. And I do it early because I find I get so annoyed. You know how it is. And then the, right. the class is so annoyed. Then the class person. will turn against They that turn person. against that person. And yeah. sometimes that person you know, does have a lot of good things that they could just calm down. But what the, I remember years ago at the Ann Farron, there was that, the, the couple that were here who did the research on men and women in the classroom. Oh, right. We were very famous, but I don't know. And I love what he said because he said, if we're going to stereotype about the sexes, Women need to develop their public voice better, perhaps, we mm -hmm. could say generally speaking, and men need to develop their public ear better, we could say, <laughs> to generalize. And I thought, oh, that's so nice, the public ear, you know, and that, I, thought, I thought that was a really thought, thoughtful way to think about, it's, it's not, there's so much emphasis on this, and not enough on the listening, and of course it's, it's not put together, it's not good working, it's not good communication, so. I, I think also for team presentations, I, I create the teams. So I'm looking at the skill set of the students. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't want the the all Chinese team going against the all American team. Right. So kind of balancing out the and nationalities. nationalities and really kind of engagement in the course, and then and try to formulate teams around that that have you know you know different skill sets. Yeah. But you can do that because you're doing it halfway through the class, right? Right. Well, yeah, or, or you can usually tell by by the third week, mm -hmm. you know, especially the talker. You can find them in the third week, maybe not the quiet one. But I think team presentations are not a big staple outside of Kogod. I mean, we have law represented, writing arts programs, management. arts management. I, I make them do it in teams. Yeah. And, and there are pros and cons. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I love legal, talk about legal debates. Yeah. Teams I have debaters. my students talk about readings in teams. Mm -hmm. Because I, I get tired of being the one saying, and then did you see this, and did you see that? So they make up those questions, and yeah. they talk to their peers. To the whole class, or within yes, to the, the group? Whole class. To the whole class. So a group of three will dissect a scholarly reading and lead that discussion. Yeah. Which I think you were saying, uh, Sherwood, that you do something like that, where they have to teach, students have yeah, to teach each I'm other. Yeah, and I'm curious about that piece, because I need for them to, I, I have decided, you know, I'm not going to address that topic, or I might have a reading on it. So people, this is the one time they're going to hear about Sarbanes-Oxley for nonprofits. Yeah. So they have to listen. You better know <laughs> it. That's right. So um, so that piece is a little, of course, I read I read the stuff ahead of time to make sure what they're presenting is actually correct, mm -hmm. you know, and obvious things like that. But yeah. I'm curious how people handle that part. And specifically the idea that the classmates have to listen for content? Yeah. And how do you determine whether they've gotten the content? Well, I assess on the terms of things. Like yeah. That. So I, yeah. I feel like the assessment piece is probably there. But yeah. Um, anyway, and and it's in teams, and then you always have to follow. Sometimes there's a slacker. Mm -hmm. in the team. You know, <laughs> that that problem mm -hmm. can happen. And mm -hmm. um, so. yeah, uh, with mine um, to kind of force the ear to content, um, I required Q and A from. I kind of set it up to where it was like if presenting next week then you you're responsible for Q&A this week and, and something yeah. along those lines kind of adding a requirement for um, the students to be in charge of Q&A and if there weren't questions then I might throw something in but it was kind of comes to them first and 
they got uncomfortable with. So they have to be ready to ask questions. And, and designated. That's what I like is yeah. it's not everyone's always responsible. Not all I mean, you should be obviously always right. responsible as a student, but I, I think it, just in life it's better to have it. I have a thought about what you raised, but I, I know you had your hand up earlier. So did you want to ask us about the um, something or? Yeah, there was. Well, there was two questions, but I guess the one that's standing out more is um, maybe can you speak about um, if you have students that are maybe international students that English is their second language, or um, students for whom whatever reason are maybe starting at a different baseline than other students? Are you assessing them based on? Criteria that you have, or are you based? Are you assessing them based on their improvement or their um, time on the curve? Fortunately, they usually come to you first in like mm -hmm. practice, right? And yeah. so they're in. Yeah. They ha it's pretty polished, at least in my experience, sometimes before it gets to me. Sometimes they're the best because they. And so really have it yeah. exactly that's that that's they're true. pretty nervous. So they've yeah. they've kind of prepared more than maybe mm -hmm. some of the others have, mm -hmm. and so they've actually worked out to be among the better pre presenters. Yeah. And um, even with so the well news rehearsed. talks, which are just short and informal, the sometimes the international students will go to Bonnie's group to practice because they're nervous about it, and it always shows. I mean, they do a really nice job but yeah. if they have some kind of practice component before it kind of I think it helps a lot so if you're thinking well great my unit doesn't have uh, you know an in-house writing center which is essentially what my office is um, I, I, I can help train your TAs you know if you have TAs and you I have a sort of very compact training um, that could be used so I think there's lots of ways to use peer I mean, obviously, it should be someone in the class. It has to be somebody who you, someone who's taken the class, who got an A in the class, who's still around, and they will often do it for free if you can't give them um, independent study credit. Which I guess first, first people want to be paid, next could be credit. Mm -hmm. But the last option is really to line for the resume, and you think about how you frame the title that you're going to give them because they're working for you for free. Um, and I, I would be happy to assist with that training because I think it's very valuable, and it, it doesn't, it's so cheap. That's why I don't understand why. American doesn't, you know, expand what we have outside of Kogod because it's a very inexpensive model. Do you give training to people from GW? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Bonnie, do you encourage students to read from cards or write with bullet points or write down everything they want to say? How do you give them those, those um, tools? So the short version is um, you should not put every you should not be writing your ideas out on cards. And in fact, you shouldn't write out your speech, as you probably know. They, most of them know that, but not all of them. Sometimes you will have people who will actually write the whole essay and then transfer it to cards. So sometimes I need to give that conversation about extemporaneous speaking and what it is. But I encourage people to practice with cards, with the low tech index card, if you don't have your iPad on the side, I think it's fine. And I give them out because I say, look, you don't have to go to the bookstore. I have plenty. And just a few key ideas per card. Mm -hmm. But when you practice, but when you're rehearsing, put them down in front of you, because you want the gestures to be available. Because otherwise, to you. they're holding. Oh, like this, this is awful. Awesome. No reading. And no <laughs> reading. So, but index cards get them away from reading because they can't put everything. And they put them down. And I say, and it's true. As long as you make eye contact with the audience initially, they don't mind if you look down for the exact 52.7 billion, you know, whatever that specific is. I mean, obviously, you don't want this. You know, if they're using slides, you want to train them away from turning their back even for a second. So I mean, I, I have more to say about that, but that's kind of the key thing. Um, and some of the faculty are very feel very violently that you should never see a card in the classroom, and that's a real mistake. I agree. Yeah. Well, I, th yeah. I think you do start with a card. So I think I think it can be I I mean I think it can be fine either way. But what you don't want is the cards in the hands and excessive reliance. But what I find is sometimes they spend so much time memorizing because they're so afraid of not having the cards. And people who are speaking from memory also aren't extemporaneous. Yeah, so and they get lost, and they, get they lost. have to start and over they ramble again. or they get flustered. So I think it's a, you know, but I, of course, do whatever faculty want, especially you. No, I think four, four by six should be abolished, uh -huh. <laughs> even cards. <laughs> no, but really, uh, Bonnie, how, how do you feel about this and, and, uh, and the team here? How do you feel about the concept of that sometimes students for that particular day, for whatever reason is, they don't want to participate. Do you force them? We talk, now we're talking about don't. discussion, right? We're talking yeah. more about discussion, mm -hmm. uh -huh. which is a, a related topic of just discussion in general. I don't force them. 
No. I don't course either. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. So <laughs> the I'm people I know, I do know some professors who, who do call on people, cold calls, yeah. um, but they have the rule that if for whatever reason you don't feel well or you're not prepared and you don't want to be called on that day, you can tell the person at the beginning. Oh, I see. Yeah. So I guess that sort of gets around that. Yeah. I've just never, I tried cold calling when I was first teaching and it just, you end up embarrassing people, and I don't feel comfortable embarrassing people. So. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. So yeah, I think the, maybe the last question, and then we'll we still have a little time, but that way with uh, Karan, and then okay, we have two questions. Then we'll this, is, this is a tiny question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hmm? What do you do with cadence with the students who are always asking if this is the way that <laughs> they talk? Can their ideas? Uh. Just stick to practicality of I've got to do extra time. What do you mean? You know. So the they students were, like I sit in. 14 weeks of classes. Because it really only was a requirement of one extra hour. I got zero pushback about it. I did make it, com- like, since it's a 500 level course, so I have both undergrads and graduate students, so I did make sure I had some evening slots available for students that work full time during the day. And that was really the only accommodation I feel like was real specific that they would get upset if I didn't do that. Otherwise, I. No one came. No one came to to me about um, having to make that extra because it wasn't much. I, would, I wasn't requiring them to go to any other sessions but the Just ones they're their presenting own. in. Yeah. It was zero. And zero it was problem. in the, the syllabus. I always say you can do a lot if you do it right from the beginning. Just with yeah. parent, as with parents, them going in. <laughs> but it's true that. Uh, but what what you know the hidden story here is that she put in, you know, aside from the everything else she does, she put in eight extra hours. Yeah. It's a lot of time. There's a clear value added to it from, yeah. um, mm-hmm. but you know what I mean. It's mm-hmm. Yeah, and if you're thinking about doing anything like that, you know, we have the software, so I just, because I know that that's, I guess you could do it on Google Calendar, but anyway, you know, there's a way to make them sign up online and you don't have to do it. I didn't it. have to manage any of it. Yeah. <laughs> that was I good mean, too. Because that's part of the I just have one quick question about assessment. I, you, you know, have groups with small groups and a lot of international lawyers. And, you know, I'll just say, after we talk about, you know, question and answer, uh, what's working, what needs work. And I find that kind of discussion immediately afterwards. It, others talk about what they have problems with. It's very, it's more useful than the written peer review. Yeah. And, uh, and I you mean they're better assessors of? Yeah, and it's I a more spontaneous discussion. Yeah. Uh, it pinpoints about two or three specific things. Yeah. Somehow the formality of the peer review, and I, which I'm not sure they all read, um, if that immediate discussion. I see, to do it verbally yeah. rather than that way. Yeah. yeah. I think I mean, the only thing is that people. Not so much with, con- I mean, yeah. a little bit with content, but yeah. presentation style. Yeah, great. Which is very, they're very concerned about. Yeah. And you do have to talk, and every lawyer has to present to clients. With authority, I would think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Every yeah. Lawyer Sometimes not for about the first five years, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the right. other thing about the business world, I think, too, are these 360 reviews. Mm-hmm. So they will have to learn how to be reviewers of co-workers, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. clients will review them and supervisors, and they'll review people. So it's t- I tell students a lot of times, it's not great to yeah. hear critique, but it's really the way of the world when you're working in teams. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm Indiana Bond. Um, we've been on cool. panels together and stuff. Yeah, yeah. and then Casey too. Yeah. You've done a great job. Yeah. Oh, really Do you, you still have um, Virginia? Virginia, yeah. yeah, she's not working very much because her brother's not uh, it's not well. And Hi, hon. Yeah, how, how, how are you? Happy New Year. Yes, Happy New Year. Year. How's life? I'm like, I'm desperate. <laughs> I hired someone else. So, just doing up where shall we put the evaluation? Upside down. You know if anybody is he mobile or is he kind of lying down? So are you affiliated with someone Oh, thank you. Thank you. How long is the recovery?